All right, so for those of you just joining us, my guest on today's CCA Leadership Development Community Interview Series is Dominic Lee, the Maverick Actuary. Uh, Dominic, in this next uh, segment, I, I wanna talk a little bit more about the uh, Maverick Actuary brand, because uh, one aspect of that, as I've gathered from, from following you on social media, is around data visualization and storytelling, um, and goes really, I think, hand in hand with those last points that we talked about in the last segment. Um, so for those who aren't familiar or maybe aren't as familiar, what do those terms mean to you, the data visualization and, and storytelling? Another great question. And I'm glad that you asked this question because it's important for me to think about someone who's so invested in this topic. But I tried to simplify it as much as possible. So data visualization is very simply turning words into pictures to facilitate smoother storytelling. It's important. First, the first point is that they're both, they both are interrelated, the data visualization and the storytelling. So data visualization and turning words into pictures to facilitate smoother storytelling. Because as we know, a picture is worth a thousand words. So it's a very, very clever way of telling a story, starting with a picture. Now, in terms of storytelling, I'll talk about like what I, what, how I envision what a story is. So to me, stories are simply a vehicle that transport us from one state to another. And there are really two parts of storytelling. The first is having a message, and then the second is having a medium. So your message can be anything, anything that any outcome informs the outcome that you want to achieve. And then the medium can take various forms. It could be a commercial, a, a television show, a movie, book, song, presentation, a social media post. And there's two quick myths I want to dispel about, um, about storytelling. The first one is that storytelling is only for entertainment purposes. I think a lot of time when I talk about it on LinkedIn, people think I'm kind of going in some fictional direction. You know, people think it's for entertainment. That's the first one. The second one is that it's, it's just all fiction. You no, know, storytelling can be about something that's very real. And you can tie that to a decision you're trying to make. And storytelling is a high impact vehicle. It resonates with a, with a large audience. It's really, it's really easy to remember. You know, if you think of, of um, like I said, I mentioned like the medium songs, people still sing songs, you know, from 20, 30 years ago, right? Because it made them feel something, you know? So that's how I, th I think of storytelling and, so, and data visuals. How do you, let me just follow on to this. Um, a lot of, I mean, on the actuarial side of things, it's very technical, very numbers heavy, data heavy. Um, what, because uh, uh, I've, I've seen people try to kind of take this to the extreme where their presentations to a client or to another stakeholder might be a lot of visuals to try to illustrate their point, but then they, they almost lose some of the data elements to it. I mean, I'd love to get your thoughts on how do you balance that visualization storytelling piece along with the more quantitative nature that, that actual real works tends to lend itself to? Yeah, so I think what you're getting at is like, how do actuaries more or less improve the storytelling abilities? That's kind of like the direction you're going in. If I'm, mm -hmm. if I'm, yeah, I think, yeah, that's a, that's a great way to, to summarize that. Yeah, so like when I think of um, how actuaries can improve their storytelling abilities and, and kind of balance those things, like there's there's three fundamental elements of, um, of like a good story. The first one is, is it's going to sound strange, right? But it's emotion. And that is that is that is uncharted territory for actuaries, you know, because we're inherently logical. Uh, but incorporating emotion is a really powerful technique uh, to connect with people. And you know, I alluded to that a few minutes ago in terms of the songs. So that's the first piece is like having an emotional connection, or some, having an emotion in there so you can connect with people on a level. The second piece, and this helps to balance for sure, is like the clarity, being able to very clearly and succinctly articulate your message. So I'll give you I'll give you an example from Beyond Insurance. So when I when I was doing Beyond Insurance, which I worked on for like three months, it took me a very long time to simplify the arc, you know, because I wanted to talk about, you know, how can we add more value outside of the space? But so I had to think of okay, this from a storytelling perspective, what do I want? I want to shift the belief. This is like thinking of a story and, and the, the outcome I want, right? The, I wanted to shift the belief that actuaries can only work in insurance to the belief that we can work beyond insurance, right? That's my goal. And then I use three words to help transition people from that first state to that second state. Reimagine, so it's reimagining what an actuary can be. I talk about that. Embrace, that's the second. So reimagine, then embrace. Embracing growth and transformation, where I talk about uh, the growth, the, the, sorry, the barriers to growth and transformation, how you can eliminate that. And then once you've eliminated them, explore, that's the third word. Exploring risk-based opportunities beyond insurance and showing where we can add value. So I, I boiled my TED talk, my TED style talk down into three words, reimagine, embrace, and explore. That's how I organized it. And that helps, that helped me hopefully take the audience from one state to another, from thinking that actuaries can only operate in one space, uh, which is insurance to, to another space, which is broader than 
than insurance. So this is the second piece. So we went through emotion, then clarity. And then the third piece is relevant, making sure that you understand, you know your audience and that uh, because your audience need to have some level of investment in your story, whatever the message. So like you talked about using a lot of visuals. You can, you can use a lot of fancy visuals, but it doesn't matter if people don't care about what you're trying to convey. So it has to be relevant. What the message you're trying to convey has to be relevant. And you need to tailor the story to your audience based on what's most important to them. So always think of the audience. So three things there, emotion, clarity, and relevance. That can help you to balance that dynamic. Yeah, you know, I, I did a um, just some professional development training that uh, we were doing internally at my company, and it was a, along the lines of delivering effective communication. And um, they gave us a template to work from, and, and part of this has stuck with me. Um, we did this a number of years ago, but in thinking about any kind of communication and, and what I'm going to put in front of somebody else, when you're planning on what that communication is going to look like, uh, it comes down to what do you want the audience to think, to feel, and to do. Right, those three things, and and I think that goes hand in hand with a lot of uh, yeah. what you're talking about. Kind of blended, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so so let's talk about how does how does somebody become an effective storyteller? So if, we, if there's somebody listening to this, uh, whether today or, or the recorded podcast, um, what can they do to improve their storytelling abilities? Yeah, I think I think the key is is um, you know to become an effective storyteller is just ensuring that you have that ability to to achieve your desired outcome through the stories. And so understanding what you want to accomplish, you know, do you want to shift the belief system? Do you want to influence, if you're in a corporate setting, you know, do you want to influence an executive to make a decision? Uh, do you want to, to get people to purchase a product or a service? So thinking, you know, just thinking of those three things I just mentioned, the emotion, the clarity, and the relevance is just kind of going back to those three points I just made, ensuring that you, you know, you're very clear on what you want to accomplish and that you're incorporating those elements into your message or into your story, the, the emotion, the clarity, and the relevance. That's what I would recommend in terms of becoming an effective storyteller. And like I said, the gauge of becoming an, an effective storyteller is, is, you know, do you have that ability to achieve the desired outcome? Like, you can test that, you know, like, did you get the outcome you wanted? If you're in sales and your goal was to get people to purchase a product or service, you monitor that subsequently and you, you know, that's, and, and that's what they do with advertising, right? You know, that's how they, I'm sure that they test advertising and different methods of that and see how effective they are. And there's very creative ways of doing that on social now too, with, with, the, with the, you know, the social media infrastructure and analytics, so. Um, yeah, and I'll, I'll put a plug in here because this is a, an area I'm passionate about. I think anybody that wants to improve on their storytelling abilities, part of that is just having the opportunities, right? And that's where I, I think for me, at least volunteering has been um, a, a huge benefit in giving me that platform to experiment in a very kind of low stakes environment. Uh, so whether that's raising my hand to speak at a, one of the uh, actuarial association meetings, uh, I, know, I know you go to the, the CAS meetings, uh, you know, I, I tend to go to the CCA meetings and, and I've had the opportunities to speak at those meetings and on webinars and, and each one of those I feel like has given me the opportunity to you know, experiment, test out and practice a little bit more to try to become a, a, a better uh, storyteller. Um, yeah, the implementation um, of the practice is very critical. Yeah, because then, I mean, you, you get to do that in the low stakes environment, and then you get to take it back to your day job and say, all right, what did I learn from that? How can I implement this? Or what would I do differently? And how does that affect, you know, whether it's a presentation to a client or another internal stakeholder, it, it gives you that, uh, that practice that maybe you couldn't get anywhere else, right? So uh, just my plug in there for the, the importance of volunteering. Um, and, and that's true, whether it's within the profession or outside the profession, there's there's lots of opportunities, I think, for people to participate um, in, in those type of activities that can give them that experience. Um, so, so let's switch gears for a few minutes here. Um, I, I wanna get your, this is our, uh, leadership development community um, interview series. And so I want to talk about leadership for a little bit. I'd love to get your thoughts on this. Um, when you think about people that you have, that you consider to be successful leaders, what, what traits do they have? How do they demonstrate their leadership? What does that look like from your perspective? Great question. And it was very ref a very reflective question for me as well, because my answer to this has changed. If you had asked me this question maybe 10 years ago or so, like when I was much, when I was much younger, 
when I wasn't even in the professional world yet. Um, I would have, I honestly, I would, I gravitated towards the more authoritarian strongman leadership. I know it sounds kind of funny because honestly, like that's what I was exposed to before the whole, before social media got to scale. You know, you grow up and you see the leader as being like the boss who, you know, everyone is afraid of and they just kind of impose their will. So that's what I thought was effective and that's what I thought worked. But in today's world, kind of having more exposure now and been in the profession for 10 years and having had, I think I've had like at least six or seven bosses by now. So I've seen many different types of leaders. So the in today's world, the, the type of leadership that I tend to prefer is a more modern style that, that carefully considers three things. One is uh, credibility, of course. This one, this one is not different. This one, credibility, you have to have a demonstrated track record of competence in your industry to be a leader and to get respect. The second thing, though, these are, these are where they get a little bit more modern is empathy. Empathy is something that people have been talking about, especially since the pandemic, mental health, all these things. Re the empathy, having the ability to understand where someone is coming from, the, the, root, the root of their beliefs and decision-making systems, and, and trying to find parity with, with your own belief system, even when, when theirs might be different. So empathy, that's something that's really important. And then the third one is autonomy is having the ability to let others, uh, you know, have ownership of their work and not to micromanage every single detail. So those three are the ones that resonate the most with me in today's world is credibility as always, empathy and, and autonomy. Yeah, you know, it's interesting in the uh, um, Enrolled Actuaries Conference that the CCA put on uh, back in May, we had a, a leadership development forum and, and one of the, we discussed an article um, that was all about high performing teams and they they boil it down to three characteristics and they're very similar to what you just articulated it was the competency aspect um, it was the autonomy and then for high performing teams it was connectedness right so um, and, and they, they, the article posed the question so how do you how do you get people that are working together to like each other right and I think there's a going to what you said there's a, a huge role that leaders can play in helping facilitate that connectedness among the people that they're working with Exactly. It all starts with leadership. Um, you know, I've, I've been in teams, thankfully, for the most part, I've had really good managers, but I've been in, I've, I was on one team where the manager, and it wasn't that he was a bad person, he was fine outside of the office, but, you know, everybody feared him, you had to ask permissions to go to meetings. It was a very toxic work environment. And so it starts with the top, you know, when the leader is not in sync with everyone else, it can be a very unpleasant experience, you know. Yeah, absolutely. So who are some of your role models when it comes to leadership and, and how have you tried to emulate their examples? You mentioned you've had several bosses over your career um, and, and other people I'm sure that you've worked with. So who do, you, who do you consider to be those role models and how have you tried to incorporate what they do into what you do? Yeah, I'm, my, my answer might be unexpected because it doesn't come from like my corporate experience. Uh, but it shouldn't be surprising because I spend so much time in the social space. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with Gary, Gary V, Gary Vaynerchuk. He's, a, mm -hmm. he's a, a very popular, you know, he's the CEO of Verna Media. He has this media company. He's into very modern things, you know, NFTs, all this stuff. But what, um, like, he, he emulates those qualities I mentioned. He, he preaches empathy and kindness. Like, he talks about, like, kindness being the new alpha trait. As, as strange as that's fun. Everyone thinks of, like, alpha traits as being just, like, very aggressive, very imposing, overbearing. But he talks about empathy and kindness. And I think it makes a lot of sense because those things are so hard to do. Like when you have a certain amount of power and you know that you have authority to really have the humility to be empathetic and kind. Like those are two things that, um, that I like about him. And I mentioned him very specifically because like as someone who, who's a social media influencer, I know that people look up to me. So I try to, I have to try to be mindful about the way, you know, I engage with people on platforms. And I know you follow me on Michael, you, uh, sorry, you, you follow me on Instagram, Michael. So you, you, you've seen some of the nonsense that I have to put up with on a daily basis, right? <laughs> it's just like, yeah, you know, people attack you all the time for no reasons, for your reasons unknown to me. I, I, I don't know. I like, I, I just make a post about my experience and it gets taken out of context. People have this visceral reaction um perhaps because of their own biases or whatever reason so i don't know but I, like to the extent that i can i try to i try not to to meet them at the level that they're meeting me at i, I think it's, it's important to model the right behavior i try to give them the benefit of the doubt to the extent that's reasonable um so i you know i, I try to, to model those behaviors of empath empathy and kindness even when it's tough so that, that's why i mentioned gary because gary's is really pushing that now which is which i think is a little bit different different from like, the classic definition of leadership you know right right yeah absolutely um you know we talked about uh, your your vision for the future of, of successful actuaries and the skills that they need to be able to develop beyond the technical um 
from a, for an actuary that's looking to be in a leadership position, whether that's within their team that they're working on within their company or within the profession as a whole, what do you view as the imperatives of future successful leaders within the actuarial profession? I would say, so, so a part of the answer is the same as the, as my previous question, you know, the empathy, the credibility, empathy, autonomy. I think that, 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 that's not domain specific. So they have to have those three, but I would add a fourth one to that specific to actuarial science, because it's really relevant is having a growth mindset. One of the, the observations I've made in the profession is that it's been the opposite. There tends to be more of a scarcity mindset. And I think it's driven by, is maybe not unique to actuaries, but in professions where you have very credentials that are very hard fought to earn, people have a pride in knowing that they're like one of the few people who can do it. So sometimes I think that cuts us off from the possibilities of, of coming back to value and impact. So I'd say like having a growth mindset is very important for a leader to model that type of behavior and recognizing that, that in the environment that we're in, that the only thing that, that's constant is change and that it's imperative for the, the profession to evolve as well. Uh, we don't have to evolve with every single change, but directionally speaking, we need to evolve and we need leadership at the top that's modeling those kinds of behaviors and not perpetuating some of the limiting beliefs of, of prior generations. So the growth mindset would be like a number four I add to the, to the first three. No I, I, no, I really like that. I think that's really important in terms of being flexible and, and being able to adapt to, uh, to the environment. Uh, that, that we find ourselves in. I mean, clearly, I mean, you look over the last decade and, and so much has changed, right? Even, even you know, 50, it was 15 years ago that the first smartphones started to become uh, ubiquitous in the market, right? And a lot changes in a short amount of time. Exactly, yeah. Um, so we did have another question that came in from those that are listening to our discussion live today. Um, and I think it's, we, we can tie this into leadership, but um, for you, having developed a brand from scratch, do you have recommendations for people who might be trying to do something similar, whether it's um, you know a passion project or or their own personal brand within uh, their work setting? Like, what what advice do you have for someone that's looking to develop their own brand? Great question, and I actually did a video on this on my Instagram. I would say it comes down to, to clarity and direction is, is understanding, and, I, and I, I alluded to this earlier in, in the interview, is you really have to understand where you add value. And the mis one of the mistakes I made early in my career, thankfully I didn't make it for too long, but I, um, I got drawn into thinking that I need to be like a super technical guy. You know, like most actuaries are just more good at visual basic and all that stuff. And sure, I did that stuff, right? Because you have to, you have to have as table stakes, you have to have a baseline. But trying to, to to not like follow the crowd and, and, and try to isolate yourself, your value, understand what you bring to the table. And it takes some time. You're going to have to, you may have to do a few roles. You may have to work on a few projects, have a few bosses, but it's understanding where you add value because ultimately you want to identify that and then you want to scale it. So that's kind of the process I did. I, I identified it. I talked about a few things earlier. I talked about uh, communication, business value, and I'm using the, you know, the power of media to kind of scale my brand. Uh, a couple, more, a few more things definitely, you know, always be authentic and it comes back down to identifying your value as well. Be authentic, be professional, and, um, you know, just try to find something that energizes you. If, if you, you're trying to do something that you're not um, inherently good at or not something that you, you enjoy, it's going to be very challenging. So, you know, try to find the value, uh, be authentic and, 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 and try to have some fun with it. You know, like this, this media stuff, don't get me wrong, it's very, like a lot of people see the stuff at the content, you know, you see the content that I'm putting out there. It takes a lot of time and effort. You know, it's a lot of work. I, when I was, before I got into this whole content game, when I saw a YouTube video and it's very well edited, you just kind of see it for three, four minutes. You think that, oh, they probably took like 10 minutes to do that. Sometimes I'm taking 15, 20 hours to edit. You know, I'm on my weekends doing this, doing, finding locations, you know, working on equipment, editing. So it's a lot of work, but it's fulfilling to me because I genuinely, you know, not, not to boast or anything, but I really feel like I'm making an impact and people have told me that. And um, so for me, it's fulfilling. and I enjoy it. It's a lot of hard work, but it's worth a sacrifice for me because I know what I want to accomplish. And it's, it's, in, it's, it's aligned with, um, with my long-term goals. So. Well, and you clearly have fun with it too. Oh yeah. 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 You know, we make memes and reels and all that stuff. You know, <laughs> you have to make like, for instance, like, 
you probably see, you know, I'm an associate and I, you know, I told you already I failed my fellowship exams a few times, but yeah, I make fun of actuarial exams all the time, right? It's like, it's something that doesn't make me happy, but like, it, it's almost like therapy for me, right? Just making fun of the exam experience and people like it because they've, they've all experienced that, those emotions and they know, you know, what it's like, like I, I made one the other day of like, <laughs> you know, having, having 10 questions to go and it's like one minute, you know, when I use like Leonidas from Spartacus, you know, getting hit with that, you know, like, I just try to have fun with it. I mean, you know, people like it for the most part. Um, so yeah, you know, you just have to try to find angles that are fun. Well, and actually speaking of memes, uh, we didn't talk about this, but um, you recently won a meme contest that one of the associations put on, right? Yes, one of the most inconsequential, perhaps, but proudest achievements <laughs> of my career, yes, is a SOA annual meme day winner for, um, for my, my meme of Ronaldino scoring the goal, saying, like, you know, squeaking by with a six on your exams. Yeah, that was <laughs> nice. Nice. Um, anything else, Dominic, that you want to impart to uh, those that are listening to uh, either our live session today or these re the recorded podcasts when they come online? Um, any parting thoughts that you want to leave us with? Yeah, I'll actually, um, you might have seen the tweet today. And, and like I said, I know people have different opinions on this, but for me, one of the, like, one of the fundamental beliefs of Maverick, in addition to all of the pandemic observations I made, is like, it's a fundament, it's, 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 it's based on that fundamental belief that I think of risk first before insurance. I think the, I don't want to call it the mistake, let's just say, the belief that many actuaries have is that actuaries are only trained to work in insurance. So they think of insurance first and they say, oh, what type of insurance do you want to work in? I think of it more fundamentally and say, think of risk first. Because if you, if we didn't have, I'm trying to remember the riddle, <laughs> it's kind of like a riddle I did. I said, like, if we didn't have risk, then we wouldn't need insurance. But if we, okay, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to mess it up. Look at my Twitter. The gist of it is that think of risk first and insurance second. Because fundamentally, actuaries are trained to, to help to, you know, to manage and assess risk. And that can lead to many opportunities beyond the traditional insurance rules. So I would say, like, always think of it in that order. Or that, that's what I was recommending. You know, some people disagree, but that's my recommendation. So, Dominic, people that want to follow you and, and see what you're up to and, and follow along with the uh, Maverick Actuary brand that you're developing, um, it, we've got about a dozen symbols behind for those that are looking on the, the video uh, cast of this. Um, any of those in particular that you would suggest that uh, or encourage people to uh, to follow you on? That's an excellent question. Yeah. So, you know, we, we have a multi-platform strategy. The goal, because I'm, I'm focused on helping to um, to maximize impact and value of actuaries and quants on a global scale, right? So it's a global, global in terms of geography and global from a platform perspective. But if I had to prioritize it in today's world, I would say, if I had to prioritize it in order, I would say LinkedIn first, that's the platform that's the most developed. That's probably where I, I um, one of the ones where I have the most activity and lots of engagement there. And then Instagram, those are the two, as you've been seeing, where I'm putting out the most content. So I'd say LinkedIn first and Instagram, um, Twitter for sure, I'm starting to tweet more. Uh, YouTube, you're going to see long form content like the ones that were like the interview we're doing now. That's going to be on my YouTube. You can see the TED style talk there. I've been fooling around with TikTok. I made a few TikToks as well. So, like, maybe those, that's why we are like five or six, maybe like those five or six to start with. The others, there's some of them I haven't really dabbled in as much. But my whole idea is that, like, anyone who wants to reach me in, at, on the platform of choice, I want them to be able to reach me, however, at, at you know, at their level or their level of comfort. That's why I'm on these platforms. I will say one more plug for the website. We're working on the website now. And the website's going to be kind of like the mothership. That's going to be like where the story of the Maverick is. You're going to have the links to all my socials. So I, I'm not going to announce the name yet because we're still in development. But that the website's going to be announced very shortly. And you can look out for that on, on my LinkedIn page I'm also, and Instagram. I'm going to announce the website name there. So that's coming very soon. And I'm very excited about that. Excellent. Well, I want to thank my guest today, Dominic Lee. Um, and uh, appreciate you joining us and, and sharing some of your thoughts. And uh, it's really exciting seeing what you're up to and we look forward to following uh, you as you uh, continue to develop this out and, and hopefully uh, for the success of the long term of, uh, of our profession. So really appreciate everything you're doing on that front. Well, I guess time flies when you're having fun. This really flew by. You know, it was a, this was a great conversation, very enjoyable. And, um, you know, it's great. It's, it's good to speak to you in person. And, as you know, I've been doing a lot of the IG lives lately, so it's good. I never thought I'd say this, but it's good to be on the other side of the, <laughs> of the interview for a change. I feel like I've been doing a lot of interviews myself. So, and it's, of course, you know, thanks again for your, you know, your continued support on, 
I always try to endorse like, you know, I feel like LinkedIn at this point is a commodity, but I'm, I'm trying to get people to, to see some of the other platforms where I do different types of content. You know? So very much appreciate your support on Instagram and Twitter. So thanks a lot for that, Mike. Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, thanks again for joining us. Uh, the leadership development community, just for those that are listening, is open to any actuary. You don't have to be a member of the Conference of Consulting Actuaries to join, but you can reach out to the CCA and request to join to be a member of the leadership development community. I want to just give a, a couple of quick shout outs. Thanks to Shannon Peterson of the CCA staff for helping to organize today's event and to the leadership development steering community. Uh, or the steering committee of our community for helping with this interview. I uh, want to encourage you to join us for upcoming CCA events and follow us online and on social media, as well as our website where you can find details on those events. Thanks again, everyone. And thank you again, Dominic, and look forward to, uh, to our next uh, opportunity. Yeah, I look forward to it. Take care, Michael. Thank you.